Gerda Tensio and uh, Ray Rock. I'll talk about uh, uh, Harry retiring, and uh, I get the question a lot when, when it's going to happen for me. I have cut my hours back to you know, four days a week, so I'm going to do it on a gradual basis. We'll see how that works out. Yeah, it's well, great. If you ever go to Tower and come on as a consultant, basically, this match would be the great thing to do now. The learning experience every day. So, probably one of the, the first things is uh, the availability of parts that we always want to find if you want to see for customers that still have those. <coughs> Rosemont has, has told us that sometime this year that they no longer will support parts for, for those instruments. So we have in-house enough analyzers that we have taken back on upgrades that we still should be able to do most of the repairs on those instruments for at least another year. That's kind of my goal anyway at this time. But uh, when it comes to the customers and uh, doing upgrades certainly is important uh, to uh, move on from the, from the Rose Hall analyzers. A lot of the customers that have the Siemens 6 series analyzers, if they're not required to uh, do the a very low range and the start at high range uh, situation, keeping the, the Ultramat 6, there's still probably the finest seal analyzer on the market. But as, as regulations change, the, the Siemens is limited to a 20 to 1 ratio. So if you have a 20 ppm low range, uh, the highest range that instrument is going to be able to do is 400 parts per million. So it, it, a lot of the, the, the newer instruments will do 10, 3,000, 5,000 on, on the high range for startup emissions. So that's just the way that the industry is going, and we have to adapt to that. So a lot of the, the new instruments uh, are basically fully computer controlled. So we have all of these upgrades that they are that they do, uh, and in the, in the in the thermal world, uh, the new IQ analyzers that have been out for four years or so now, but they're still going through upgrades of firmware, and sometimes they'll make a change and create uh, another problem that they uh, that added to the, the fix that they were making. So uh, the latest upgrade that they had made uh, in one of the plants in New Jersey, they worked the, the, the tech worked with the thermal uh, directly and they got the new the new firmware added to the IQ analyzers. They've been good uh, without any problems for about three weeks. We had another site in Oklahoma that they had to send the new, uh, new chips that are loaded only with the new software to put in the, in the instrument. They weren't able to do it uh, by the new That's kind of where we stand on the And that was at the lake side, Lakewood, and the Jersey side that they did that. Yeah, I'm going to so they talked about the new inversion of uh, the Teledyne analyzers. We have not purchased any of those. We have demonstrated to us. Uh, they're going along some of the same lines that uh, the thermal analyzers did. Their concern, I guess, is that analyzers have a tendency to use too much electricity or too, uh, uh, their energy calls is what the, their description was. So going to a uh, high power DC power supply running all the years and, and uh, along those lines, that's what Thermo did with their IQ series and Teledyne is going to follow that same pattern. Hopefully they will have the, the 
still have their uh, firmware or uh, up to date before that the upgrade gets on the on the hands of the customer. So I know Ray was doing a lot of talking. Uh, just, I've only been with Cisco for a year. Uh, had no prior experience with commissions or anything like that. Um, David's been trying to hire me for quite a while. I was always active in the Air Force, so obviously he would take the job. Uh, but I went to reserves, and, and here I am. Um, I've been working with Ray since September of last year, and this man has a wealth of knowledge. Uh, I am better with the newer analyzers, the, the thermos and the cabbies. Uh I call him the wizard when it comes to like rose months. It's, you know, it's figured out. Um, but when you guys order a, a SEMS system and you got random analyzers in it, or you order spares or replacement analyzers, if it's the, the new tapping of thermals, I'm going to sit that. Um, I go in, I, I put in all your ranges, and all your voltage and current, I update the firmware, and to kind of piggyback on the firmware issues with the thermos, we had a batch of thermal IQ analyzers that when the power was cycled on, it dropped all user settings. And so it would convert from parts per million back to parts per billion. And so that's the, the upgrade, thermal upgrade that thermal released afterwards to address that issue. But with releasing that firmware upgrade, they actually introduced another issue where if you try to do too many things at one time on the analyzer, it would freeze up and it would reboot itself. Like an angry Windows computer. So um, Ray and I work closely with the thermal tech support and the tapping tech support. We got you know, the tapping reps that we talk with on a regular basis because we're kind of their R and D partner. Um, we tell them what, what we want, and you know sometimes they deliver, sometimes they don't. And like he was saying, with these new N series analyzers uh, from Tappy, they run the new review software, so the interface itself is pretty much the same. They have changed a little bit within it to make it more friendly for the end user, uh, but as like an analyzer tag or a maintainer on site, you know, you put in that admin code and you've got basically the same accessibility and functions and rights within uh, configuring the analyzer. Uh, the end series analyzers, they are trying to, I think, piggyback what Thermo is doing as far as having everything kind of daisy chain, which Honestly, from an analyzer technician standpoint, that's kind of a nightmare because it makes it hard to troubleshoot. Because uh, if one component goes bad, it's going to affect everything. So, narrowing down what is wrong with it can be harder. But it also makes the, you know, the benefit to that is you can swap parts out quickly. Uh, instead of having a bunch of different size connectors and all these connectors inside of it, it's all one universal connector. So, the hot swap ability for repairs is there to reduce the downtime, but to sit and actually troubleshoot, it kind of makes it a little bit harder. Um, but I found what I got, I guess. So when it comes to, in, in years past, most of the systems that we've sent out, customers would buy spare instruments because as technology increases, being able to troubleshoot and get an analyzer fixed on site for the technicians that are on in these plants, it, it, it really is easier. Do you think the technology would make that situation much easier? But now, uh, I, th I think it's a bigger, I think it's a bigger challenge. So having a spare in an instrument as if it's a working spare, uh, you can put it in, in place and ship it to us, and, and we can do the, you know, the repairs on it. If you have a complete analyzer, you have every part available to you to repair it at your at your at your site. Because a lot of times it's a possibility it might be one or two different components until you physically replace those individual components. You 
really don't know. Uh, we see that. We see that all the time. So I would encourage people to have spare instruments. Yeah. Any questions for us? Ours is short and sweet. Not much. Right. Sorry, we're going to be using this. Thank With you. The, the current Teledyne analyzers, I know we uh, did upgrades a couple years back on one of our sites. Uh, one of the issues we noticed, if we have a power failure to the sim shock, the touch screens would become unresponsive when they come back. Um, and they basically just went defective. I was wondering if you all run into that before and if you had some suggestions or improvements for it. I can't say that we experienced that. Two or three years ago, in high humidity <clears throat> areas, we had some touch screens you know, totally fail. Uh -huh. that had to, to be replaced. We haven't had uh, probably in the last four months issues. We've been having the same issue with touch screens on the Teledyne. Um, just going on responsive. We can't, uh, we have to end up using a mouse. But, right. Over yeah. the U.S. before you can put the mouse in and do anything. Yeah. Too sure what would be causing that other than replacing the display. Yeah, we well, we kind of stopped just replacing and just using the mouse. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, because it's in, in some cases where the displays failed, even the mouse wasn't an option. You're, yeah, you're probably there was a hero of your horse that that is a good thing. All right. Um, so there's one from um, our online chat. It says that he works with you at their Empire Generating. And the question is the DMOD boards and controlling CO drift. Okay, at Empire Generation, they actually sent the Teledyne technician to that site. And one of the things that we found, or they found, was that. CO analyzer and that particular circuit is temperature sensitive. So if you have your air conditioning set too cold and it, the analyzer sucks in cold air, you'll get drift. Uh, on, the, on the CO detector failures, three or four years ago, they didn't have issues with the detectors failing in the manufacturing process. Uh, we still get an occasional one, but for the most part, they pretty well got that uh, the detector issue. I think that answers the question. All right, thanks. But as someone that has the 951s right now, and I do have a budget to do an upgrade next year, we got some money that we are going to upgrade our analyzer. I'm not saying um, From Cisco's point of view, of course, I want to know what analyzer I want to go to. I want to know which one is going to be the best for the long term. You guys know all the pros and cons of these analyzers, but what are your recommendations? Well, you yeah. have basically three options. I guess you have California Analytical, and we haven't sold a lot of those instruments, so having uh, spare parts available for those were pretty limited there. So, basically, our two main instrument manufacturers of thermal and, and telephone. Because of the issues that they had with the IQ series, they're probably not my favorite at the moment. And so if you were asking for the current recommendation, probably the Teledyne would be my, my personal recommendation. Um, the I series analyzers that thermal used and basically what they're using in the IQ uh, the individual detection components and all of that, they really, they really were an excellent analyzer. But when the uh, analyzer manufacturer comes out with a new model, there is a date that they no longer, you know, sell the previous one. So we didn't have any choice. Now, and from what I've heard just in the previous presentation, and uh, Teledyne analyzers don't have that remote, remote control for the audio efficiency. Right, so it doesn't have a, a digital input to change it, the analyzer from NO or from NOx to NO. Right. Okay. 
that's probably worth it. Thermal, the I series analyzer that we have in the training shelter, uh, does have that capability. I, I can't tell you whether the IQ does or not. The, the, the not, not that that's a requirement for us now, but of course, as things, who knows what the future holds, right? That could be something. So, is that an option that I don't want to worry about? Or is it, yeah. So, how that this whole situation with NO2 converters comes up is when the site does rata testing and the SIMs end up being lower on NOx reading, they automatically believe that it's a converter issue inside the NOx analyzer. Sometimes that's true, sometimes that's not. The, the good thing is that they have a cylinder of, of NO2 to test their, their equipment, they're required to do that. And you could, they're generally willing to let you take that cylinder and do a converter test, you know, if they're there for RADA, just to prove that that's true or not true. And a lot of times it ends up being stratification or some other issue more so than it is the instrument. So on our probes, we have an audit port and we'll have the test team hook up to that audit port and audit port and in a lot of times to the, whatever the readings match. So you, know, you end up with all kinds of things there. But converters do have a life depending on the concentration they do each year or not. But in, in the cylinder method at the, at the Lakewood facility that we that I personally deal with dealt with over the years a lot, uh, using the, the bottle method, the cylinder method, generally, you know, even if the cylinder was in good shape and you had a known good converter, you never got much over 90%. So on, on the device that Lynn has, has, has developed, we get more of the well, probably real world 95 plus in, in the test that he's done uh, using that on. So the converters in the instruments are probably actually better than the testing that you results that you see from the elements. It just has worked out better. Most of the time, they, because uh, the instruments that we buy from, from Teledyne, most of those have molly converters, which are low, lower temperature converters. So if we have to deal with a situation with high concentrations of CO that can get at high temperatures, can, it'll actually destroy the CO. Uh, we, Usually, the, the lower temperature converters. The converters in the thermals run at 600 degrees C, and so we have to be careful on how we design the system dealing with, uh, with the CO, high concentration CO. And what about uh, dual element analyzers? Uh, on the dual, we're, we're all dual fuel units, so we have dual, um, or dual range analyzers. Right. That, uh, so in the analyzer that you have, the Rosemont, it has a single analog output, the VLC with a range relay, and going to the to the instrument itself literally changes the analyzer's range. You can see it on the display change from the energized to high gas or the low gas. In newer instruments, they have a dedicated analog output. So then the VLC, when you're during normal operation, when you get to 90% of range. One, then it starts looking at range two and as far as what which output that it's monitoring. So the, the analyzer never really changes ranges. It has two active ranges and analog output for both at the same at the same time. So whenever you do an upgrade, you have to have another input for the second channel or the second range. Most of the new instruments, we have a analyzer fault output, so that also requires another input into the PLC. So either the thermal or the tap, they they both they both have the analyzer fault, but, but so.
So it, it gives a uh, in, indication in the control room that the analyzer has an issue. Um, it's, it's a way of letting them know that they need to go check the instruments. Even though their only requirement is for that analyzer to page pass the data calibration. Okay. Just thinking out loud here, there's one more difference uh, slightly when it comes to the blue range analyzer between the tap and the thermal. Uh, the thermals will go higher. 500. Uh, uh, the uh, the PPM on the range, on the high range of the NOx analyzer. Uh, the TAPI has two different <coughs> analyzers. They have the TAPI analyzer, well, they have three, but the M analyzer will go to 200 ppm, and then the H will go higher up to that 500 range if you need it to. So there's a little bit difference in the ranges. Most of our applications that, uh, of the sites that we have, the 200 ppm is adequate as the max value, but it's just another consideration we have to have. Uh, but as Ray said, the, the decision on the new analyzers now is uh, more of personal preference. Thermals had a lot of firmware issues. Uh, and to address the issue on the end series analyzer, we're going to talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, and when I come up here with obsolete equipment and some other stuff that goes with it. But I'm not a shy person when it comes to talking to my vendors, and especially the analyzer vendors and the heated sample line vendors. Those are my favorites, uh, <laughs> both of them equally. Uh, the, uh, so we made a very big point to both Thermo and to Teledyne, and I'll continue to do so, that if we want something or need something or we're testing and we find fault, uh, we're the first ones to pick up the phone and let them know that they have a major problem. Uh, a few years ago, we were in St. Louis, so when the IQs came out, and I stood up in the Thermo meeting and told them, now do you want me to tell you the next 20 minutes what problems with your analyzer are? And so in front of 200 people, we let them know what uh, the analyzer shop had found out about all the problems with the thermal. The thermal made a big mistake they, when they first came out of the analyzer. Is no one cares about sentence, they only care about ambient emissions. So that analyzer was a great ambient, ad, uh, ambient uh, emissions or ambient air quality analyzer with great firmware for that. But we had to do daily calibration checks, and they said, well, an analyzer could never go negative, but how could that happen? It happens every day when you run a zero. What, what are you talking about? And they had no idea. So the analyzer would auto fault as soon as you, your, your uh, O2 uh, went to went negative. It was a mess. But they're gradually coming back and they're creating other problems too. Yeah. Uh, one other caution on replacing NOx analyzers. We had a site that went out and bought their own analyzers to replace 951Cs. And they found out that the analyzer wasn't capable of receiving an input from the PLC to change ranges. What was that? Uh, that was the uh, Exxon uh, down in Texas? Yeah, I don't remember what it was. But what they were coming up with was their span gas for their low range was making the analyzer automatically range up to the high range. They couldn't control it. They couldn't force it to stay in the low range while it was being spanned. So they had to end up buying span gas that was say 80% of the range rather than 90 because 90 plus and minus if you have a you know a 95% of, of step change. So I forget what kind of brand analyzer they bought, but uh, they realized after the fact that you couldn't control the range on the analyzer, the analyzer was going to switch ranges when it saw a certain concentration, and of course during calibration, that's uh, it's kind of a failure. So be careful of that. So. All right, we're going to take about 15 minutes uh, break, uh, and uh, I'll put my watch on timer so that I remember it. We'll come back in about 20 after 10. Uh, we'll come back. Thanks. <laughs>